in a space of denial and I'm using my mind to stay in a space of denial. The tr tr truth is that I'm not willing to acknowledge the truth at the soul level, not at the mind level. So let your mind, at the moment for many of us, the mind, you could say, is the active controller of my life. And the soul just has to f follow around doing whatever the mind says. So the mind says, oh, deny that, you know, the soul is saying, deny all emotions. So, so the, soul just, the soul just allows the mind from then on to take control. And the mind just denies emotion, denies this, denies that, you know, has all these intellectual jumps, one after the other, after the other, to get away from my emotion. And I learn all of these different tools that my mind just keeps on generating, because in the end, my soul doesn't want it. As soon as your soul flicks into this state of now it wants to, your mind will have a different role. And you know what your mind's role will be then? Will be, I'm going to look for anything that exposes these emotions. And that will become your mind's role. So then your soul will be completely dominant, and your mind will just be responding, I'm just going to keep doing this to help my soul, help my soul, help my soul. And that's where we need to be. <coughs> So usually by the time we get down to there, we've become aware, at least, of what we're doing to shut ourselves down. And because we've done the fearless, we've also become aware of why we shut ourselves down. And when we're in those states, at least we're telling ourselves some truths. Whereas before that state, we're actually not acknowledging many truths. So to open up yourself emotionally, in, when we do some uh, we do some workshops up at up at Queensland at times, and we may do some here too. Yet, what we do is we take you through that process of the fear list, and then the tools of denial list, and then we talk we talk about even more powerful things after that that you can do. But most people struggle with those two things, to be honest with themselves. And so often in the group, what we do is I get the person up and they start talking about their fear list. And then I, then I list off a heap of other fears that I can feel in them right, that they have to write down as well. Just because, they, because a lot of times we're just so tuned out of what we're really afraid of. And if you're tuned it's out... It's an art form, I can tell you. It's an art form, yeah. yeah. And by the time we're 40, 50, 60, we've gotten pretty good at this, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're experts right, at, at this denial process, but it, but it hurts us a lot. Keep it in the head, it's safe. Yeah, and mainly when we do it... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Um, yes, do you have to... Is it necessary to feel all... You talk about the capping emotions like anger and... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a lot better at feeling the sorrow, the grief emotions that aren't threatening to me or anybody else. Yeah. But I don't want to feel the anger emotions. Do you yep. have to go through that phase? Or can you say <coughs> that's a capping emotion? I'll go underneath and, and try right. to avoid that one. Can you jump over your capping emotions? Yes. <laughs> yep. uh, it's a good question because it, because it depends, actually, on a few different things as to whether you can jump over your capping emotions or not. The way emotions are created is there are what we would say causal emotions and then there are effects from those causes, right? And and during our life, there's this cycle that goes on. So let's say a basic cause of the emotion is mum and dad, right from the time you were in the womb and your mother didn't want you. Let's say. But she felt she had to have you, but she didn't want you. So let's say that's a really basic core emotion, isn't it? Right? I'm not wanted. AJ, can I just interrupt at that point and say that that was Paul's first wife's problem? His parents openly said when she was born they didn't want her. Yeah, it's, and the ones that are open are better than the ones that are not open about it, to be honest. Because mm. that's even harder. If mm. the person's not open about it, you're feeling it, and they're telling, they want, they, they're telling you they loved you, but you're feeling they didn't. Mm. That sets up lots of problems. Right? Mm. Even more problems than they're just telling you straight out they didn't want you. Mm. Yeah. So I'm not wanted. That creates what? A lot of effects in the child, doesn't it? It feels what? Unloved? Right? So that's the effect feeling. Right? <coughs> that feeling of unloved gets passed back now. I'm also unloved now, and it becomes a core belief. And unloved creates a lot of other things happening now, doesn't it? In every interaction, I'm going to feel unloved. Yeah, it stops you. It stops you. I, I try to pour love in, and I just get bouncing off. Yeah. And then, if you feel unloved and you really want to be loved, what do you start doing then? 
Yeah. Well, you get angry or you start earning love. One of the two. So you start feeling you have to earn it. So how many of you have had to earn your love during your life? Have you felt that? Yeah, lots, lots of us. At least half it will be because it depends on our personality of whether we react angrily or we have to earn it. You know? And so we go down this track, I've got to earn love. So now I've got another emotion there, earn love. Can you see that the emotions are just keeping building now from that basic core emotion? Now, what am I going to need to do to unravel all of this? Dig deep. Well, obviously I'm going to need to feel the, the last one first, probably. So I need to be aware that I'm earning love. Why am I earning love? Because I actually feel unloved. Why do I feel unloved? Because the truth is that I wasn't loved and I wasn't wanted when I was little. You know, and you'll go, every one of those steps will be an emotion. You follow me? Every single one of those steps will be an emotion. Now there's something else, there's another aspect of your question though, because I'm not getting at the core of it just yet. Oh, could you jump the anger? Oh yes, that's right. Now, one of these core, one of these effects is going to be anger, right? I'm going to be angry, particularly when I'm treated unfairly in, in some way as a young child, right? So, the, there will be some, what I would classify as childhood anger that's in me as well. That, and how many times were you allowed to be angry when you were little? For most of us, not at all, right? The instant we got angry, what happened? We got punished, physically usually, and usually painfully. Right? So what did we learn about anger? You got to keep that down too. Right? Now, the problem is, I'm not, a lot of times, there's two types of anger that we have, two types of rage within us that we have. One type is the type of rage that's all about denial. The other type is this childhood rage. And this childhood rage and this childhood anger will need to be expressed no matter what, because it's locked up within you. The adult anger can completely be skipped over. Now, the difference in terms of the experience is when you're in a childhood anger, it feels like a tantrum. Right? And even as an adult, some of you might have felt quite ashamed of yourself at times getting into what you've seen as a tantrum. You are actually in a childhood anger state at that point, and you need to let yourself experience it. You don't have to harm other people with it, but you do need to let yourself experience it. So go outside, get a stick and an old piece of water, something, bash the hell out of it, swear and scream and yell. And if this and you know that, and away you go. Just do that. That's quite like a possession, though. That can. That's when people really do go over the edge and kill and that because it's like they've just completely lost it. Not if you own it in that in the way that I've just stated. If you don't own it, you can certainly go into the other state. And if you if you don't own it, you can certainly be very much influenced by a spirit who's willing to also help you not own it. Mm and do some very damaging things. So the key is to own it and be with it in a private space. That's the key. When you're in a private space, you can't harm anyone else with it. But not everyone's going to be aware of that, are they? No, but we're talking to a group of people who are asking the question about their awareness. So, so the advice is still the same. Do you recommend building soundproof rooms? <laughs> well, there is an emotional there's an emotion in you that requires a soundproof room. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> me? Yeah. I've, I'm frightened of, uh, of people condemning me. Exactly. And that emotion needs to be confronted too. How's that going to be confronted? By you actually feeling your emotions and being condemned. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, I think in my case, I think I, I saw that my father was a very, very angry person. And I just made the decision very early on, I don't ever want to be like that. Yeah. Is that... So then I think I denied the part of it. Well, that, that's one of your blocks like that. now. That's yeah. because of a block to feeling some of your emotions, because there is some childhood anger there. And so, so that childhood yeah, anger... he was the only one in the family who was ever allowed to be angry. Exactly. He had all the anger, and so we weren't allowed to do anger. Exactly. So I... I 
obviously have a lot of anger about that, but I don't want to be there because I saw how horrible exactly. it was to be angry at people. Because yeah. but you, let's look at how he really was, though. He was angry, but what did he do? He didn't own it, did he? He didn't go out and do his private work with it, did he? What he did instead was... Took it out on things. Yeah, and that's the, that's the emotion that's blocking the processing of your own anger, that it was taken out on you. So if you can uh, let yourself firstly feel that, that when my father was angry, he was just taking it out on me all the time, taking it out on me all the time, taking it out on us all the time, <coughs> and let yourself really have grief about that, then that will also allow you to experience some of the anger that you feel about that as well. And then, don't take it out on others when you're feeling it, but go into that private space, do what he should have done which is go to that private space, you know, get out there with a wood, wood axe or something, away you go, or, and just really, really go for it and let yourself experience that, that rage. I've had to do that myself uh, a number of times in my life. And, and that's helped me. As soon as you do that, what I've found is it connects you with even deeper grief. Um, so a lot of times I've been out there furiously getting into the axe or something like that with the wood, and then all of a sudden... I'll be on the, on the ground having a big sob about something that that was connected to. Yeah. So we usually underneath wouldn't there be un unworthiness because their anger is directed at you and you feel not, not good enough. Yeah, there's lots of them at once actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just that unworthiness is a really basic core one, but on top of unworthiness there's all sorts <coughs> of things like um, you know, being shut down, not allowed to express myself, not allowed to be honest, not allowed, you know, there's so many different things that mm -hmm. That, that's one emotion Yeah, I think I felt I must have been a bad person, so I've carried this whole thing self guilt, self shame. That I'm yeah. a bad person. Yeah. Because he's angry, I must have. You were to blame. He, he constantly told you and treated you like you were to blame. Yeah, yeah. so I've carried around this thing of I'm, I'm bad, so to make people love me, I've got to be a nice person. So I've invented this, like you were saying yesterday, I've invented this other person who is all the nice things and don't want to be what I really am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You'll get to a stage horrible. you get to the stage where you've released all of those emotions though and you'll automatically be a nice person without having to try. Right? So it's just that we need to feel these emotions in between so first. Yeah, and, and integrate them first. Yeah. Can I change direction? Um, I want oh, to stay yeah. on the emotional direction for a bit longer if we can. Is, is it possible to feel that love in the womb? Yes. But that love you felt wasn't necessarily permanent, you've attached yourself to it, like maybe your mother's been going through a bad time yep. and doesn't want you, but it doesn't mean she doesn't love you. Um, yeah, she, you know, she may, like a lot of, what happens with a lot of pregnancies, particularly in, in, generations ago, and, and the older generations, and it happened in my own case, is where a mother gets pregnant out of wedlock or something like that at 16 or 17, um, and then, of course, you know, what's, what's going to happen to her, you know, you know 10, 20, well, 30 or 40 years ago, what would have happened? There's so much ostracism, so much judgment, like so much family issues about it. And, and, you know, right at that moment, they probably felt like they wished they'd never done it and wished that this, this little person inside of her was never there. And then, you know, they'll feel even guilty about their own thought of that a lot of times. But that emotion has entered. Mm. Yes. So with a mother having lost a child, what can she do to in, in pregnancy? Yeah. Miscarriage. What can she do to is there anything she can do to help that lost child? And that lost child is automatically cared for by a celestial spirit in the spirit world mm -hmm. in Summerland. And the, the issue is, the mother needs to address is let go of firstly her grief about the losing of the child, mm -hmm. but secondly she needs to let herself feel about some of the causal emotions that cause her body to reject the child. Right? And there are emotions that cause miscarriages. And oftentimes the emotions that cause miscarriages are about how you feel about yourself, how badly you feel about yourself as a woman, or how badly you feel about the opposite sex. You follow me? And a lot of times a miscarriage will result... Let's say you have a male child growing inside and you feel really angry with the opposite sex, then that male child is already feeling like you're angry with it. 
You follow me? And so is it feeling wanted? No. And if, the, if you feel really bad about yourself as a woman, you feel that women have a terrible lot in life and you feel that, you know, all that women are just going to experience a lot of bad things in their life and you have all these emotions that you've unresolved as a woman and you've got them quite strongly in different ways, if a girl child is growing inside of you, what is she going to be feeling? That she's unworthy, that she's no good, you know, that she's going to have a terrible life. You know, she's feeling exactly those emotions. Not being able to verbalise them, of course, but feeling them. And so often these kind of emotions are what cause these, these, um, you know, these miscarriages that occur. By the way, the father can cause a miscarriage in the mother as well by his emotions. So it's not just all to do with the mother's emotions. Now, because of that, the child miscarries. But the individualization process has been complete. The child is being looked after. You're, you, you will actually know that when you're in your sleep state. You'll be with the child in the sleep state anyway. Um, so uh, understand that all you need to do is deal with your grief about the whole thing and you can have a very, very close relationship with the child. And so much so that you'll feel them with you all through your waking hours. You'll feel them sometimes even playing with your own, the other children who are alive. You'll feel all sorts of things occurring. And I've actually talked to many miscarried children um, and, and, and actually reintegrated them, if you could call it that, with their families when their families have been in emotional denial about the actual miscarriage. So if you go through emotional denial about the miscarriage, what that does is it sets up a barrier between you and that child. And the child doesn't want to come to you because every time they come to you, you feel sad. So what I'd like you to do is actually deal with your sadness, release your sadness, and then they can come to you and just enjoy your company. You follow me? Abortion. Abortions are a bit different because abortions are where the mother made a choice, or, the, or both parents or the father forced her, into making a choice to get rid of the child. And that, that obviously has already had some quite strong emotional damage on that child, right? Mm -hmm. They're still cared for in the spirit world in the same manner, by a spirit, a celestial spirit who nurses them and cares for them and gives them love. <coughs> but it's rare for that spirit to encourage contact between the aborted child and its mother until its mother works through the reasons why she decided to abort her or, or the father works through his reasons why he decided to force her into having an abortion. And so the child is protected from those emotions until the mother works through those emotions and then a, a, a relationship can be re-established. Does that make sense? Um, just to add a comment about abortions, um, there, is, there is often this um, feeling uh, that people have that I've got the right to decide whether this child lives or dies because we don't see the child as a, as a soul yet. We only see the child as a soul when it's born. Oh. But the truth is actually the child is a soul almost short, just a, just a short period of time, just a few days after conception, that the child connects to the, these bodies. And from that moment on, the child is a child. And it's actually experiencing everything. Right? It's in, individualized and it's experienced everything. So, so the important thing to understand is that for any person who's experienced an abortion not knowing these facts is to actually work through some emotions about them because you will, you will find that there is some guilt or shame that you have about the abortion itself that is actually damaging you emotionally and it's a matter of working through those emotions. So I've had many, we've talked to many women obviously over these last five years or so who have then once they've realised the truth, gone through quite a lot of emotions about why they chose to actually have an abortion and what were the reasons inside of themselves that they chose to do that or their husbands for that. There was one lady I talked to who had 34 abortions. Her, her husband would get her pregnant. They were, they were, he was a Catholic man. He would get her pregnant and then force her into having an abortion. Um, and he did that, they had 34 abortions, she had 34 abortions, if you can imagine that. Um, so there's quite a few emotions she will have to work through regarding that herself. And also the man, because of his violence, uh, he was a policeman actually, um, he, because of his violence, and he murdered 34 children by his actions basically, 
um, he's got quite a poor condition, as you can imagine. Um, and so he he's not working through his stuff at all, by the way. And, which, and you can see that he still he still justifies his own actions, but very damaging actions uh, that's been to her and to him and to the children involved actually as well. Um, and now one of the children who survived, um, the only children that survived this man's actions and his forcing his wife into abortions all the time. There were, there were three children who survived that, that because the abortions failed or they were left too long before they could be carried out by a doctor. A doctor refused to carry it out. Even the doctor, by the way, has lots of issues to work through in this case, uh, emotionally, from a, from a law perspective of love, because he carried out, 30, the same doctor carried out these abortions, 34 abortions for one woman. So, you know, there's quite a lot of emotional issues to work through for every single person involved in these transactions. Um, the three children who survived, one of these ladies is working through her emotions on the divine love path. She wasn't wanted either, but, and her mother wanted to abort her, and the father wanted to abort her as well. But the doctor refused because her term had gone too long. And, uh, and so she's got some pretty deep emotions to work through about, like, all of her life not being wanted or loved by both of her parents. Yeah. So it's a pretty big issue actually in the world today. There's a lot of negative things being created by, by the abortion process. But again, don't judge the act. Get into the emotions that created the act. Because that's where, that's where the truth is, in those emotions. So. Let's say if there's a woman who was 15 or 16, pregnant, and the thing that she'll need to do is work through some of these emotions of her parents forcing her into something she didn't want to do, you know, and all of those kind of things. That's what she needs to perhaps work her way through. If there's an older woman who was single, got pregnant, didn't want anyone to know, had an abortion instead, then she needs to work through some issues regarding, you know, how strongly she's willing to act just to stop other people from criticising her. So her fear of judgement is what caused her. You know, her fear perhaps of security, not being looked after. Her fear of not knowing what to do. Her Just her own confusion might be just an emotion she needs to work through. The key is to work through those emotions, not judge yourself for anything you may have done, but work through the emotions that caused you to make those decisions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So not, not, not the actual decision itself but the emotion that created the decision. Because that's the real cause. Remember? It's the cause of emotion that creates these effects. The effect was an abortion. The cause of emotion was something else. Deal with that. All of God's laws, by the way, that operate upon the soul, operate on the cause of emotions. They don't operate on the effects. Do you, do you understand that? They will operate on the actual emotion it's inside of us. You think of the law of attraction that we've talked about a bit already yesterday. The law of attraction operates on the emotion you're feeling right at the moment. It doesn't operate on what you think or the effects of those emotions. It operates on the emotions themselves. Because that's what it's trying to expose. The emotions themselves. Yeah. So if you can focus on that, then you'll progress really rapidly. If you focus on feeling judged about the effects and you know, going into self-judgment about the things you've done in the past and all of those kind of things, right? There are guilt. There is a penalty of the soul law of compensation where you will feel guilt and shame. Feel the guilt and shame. Like feel the emotion. You know, don't focus on what you did. Feel the emotion of what you did. Yeah. Is it true that all of God's laws are love-based? All of God's laws are love-based. Yeah, all of them. Right. Yeah. So the um, even the physical ones. The law of attraction is a love-based law. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. All of the laws that God's created are all based around love. That's why love. Remember, I said yesterday there's a hierarchy of laws, mm -hmm. and the highest in the hierarchy of laws are the laws of divine love. The laws of divine love overcome, just like the law of aerodynamics overcomes the law of gravity. The law of divine love overcomes all other laws. So. If you operate in the zone in your life where you're actually in the laws of divine love, which are all about God's love, not your own, by the way, and you 
stay in those laws, you will find that your life just becomes so free, like you can do anything you want in that in that space, and and everything will be create everything you create will be wonderful. It's only when you get out of that space into the lower laws and you start creating things for other reasons that you start breaking some of these other laws that they, their penalty comes into effect. So, can you give me an idea of what might have happened? When I was about six weeks pregnant with my first child, my father was killed. Yeah. How would that have affected... I've never thought about it before, but I can see now that we've had an effect on him. How might it have affected him? Your first child was a male, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm. And how were you feeling when your father died? Um, I was shocked. Yeah. Uh, disbelief. Yeah. And I don't think I grieved that much. Yeah. And it's the holding on to that grief that would have certainly affected your first child. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Right. Right. It's very much related, in fact, to the things that we were talking about this morning. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. You know, how Grant sort of still hasn't left home, still... Yeah. You know, a lot of that is about your desires to keep him with you. Um, and it's all about your grief about your dad. When you release the grief about your dad, you'll find that... You'll find that Grant might decide to just get up and say, Oh, I want to leave home now. <laughs> Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. Where does manipulation come into Manipulation? Mm. And manipulation at the soul level or an intellectual level? Because there are just two different types really, isn't there? Like, sometimes we know we're manipulating someone else at the intellectual level, don't we? Like, sometimes we know that, oh, um, you know, I want them to do something for me, so I do something for them that will cause them to feel like they're guilty if they don't do something for me. You know, things like that. You know, we, we often plan these kind of things in our mind. Right? Um, the real manipulation occurs at the soul level that most people, almost all people, are not aware of. Then that is where the crap's in the middle of the floor, and I'm skirting around your crap so that you skirt around mine. So we're making, we're actually making a soul choice together. That if I avoid your stuff, you'll avoid my stuff, and we'll all get along fine. Sounds equitable, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's very much manipulation. Yeah. And so what I find is when I start talking truth to people, a lot of people do respond angrily. And the reason why they respond angrily is because it exposes their own soul desire for manipulation. And a lot of people don't want to see themselves as they truly are. They feel judged at that point, and then they get angry. So we had a discussion, interestingly enough, uh, Qualities of Divine Truth, it's a DVD that uh, has been produced recently. Because there was, a, there was a hundred, close to 100 people in the audience and I was talking about the Qualities of Divine Truth and I mentioned something about what I had to do in terms of living in truth. One of the things I said to the audience was that if you love truth, you will actually live in truth 100% of the time. You will say the exact truth that you feel 100% of the time in all situations. Now, obviously that triggers a lot of people around you. No? So, so let's say you go up to someone, you shake their hand, and, and sometimes, and this has happened already with some of you, I've, I've given you a hug or something, you say, boy, you're feeling really sad. <laughs> right? Or something like that, straight away. Imagine that, the first time you meet somebody, the first thing they say to you is, you're feeling really sad. Or, or you're feeling quite angry, or you're feeling like whatever, or right, this is what I'm feeling from you. Right? Now, the beauty of that is it straight away puts the transaction, instead of being this surface level intellectual thing going on, straight away the transaction becomes soul to soul. I had a young fellow come out to visit me a few weeks ago. He said he wants to be my friend. So I sat him down and I said to him that... Uh, that I want to know the real him and not the fake him. And he'd come out just to present to me the fake him. And I didn't want that. I wanted to know the real him. So I, talk, I started talking a bit about the real him, about what I could feel was really going on within him. Within about an hour of our discussion, he was going to get quite upset. And I suggested that, you know, he perhaps go off and just have a think about it. And he was getting angry and upset. And what was happening was, my statements to him were triggering a lot of his emotions with his dad. And he was starting to really feel those emotions. 
Now, after a day of that, he got so upset that I had to say, you need to go home. Uh, but, can I just say before you go home, I want to get to know the real you. Mm. And I love you, and I want to get to know the real you. And when you're ready to let me know the real you, please come back. And I wasn't manipulating him. So manipulating him would have been doing what? Buying into this game. Buying into the game, yeah. Buying into the game. So you, you see, the truth is that there are many of us know what another person's emotional injuries are, right? Because there's a pro common problem we all have, and that is we can see everyone else's emotional injuries except their own. <laughs> right? So what we do is we, we, then, we then sometimes go into the state of manipulating those emotional injuries for our own benefit. You follow me? So if you, let me give you an example. If we know somebody is angry, an angry person, what do most of you generally do if you know somebody is just a generally angry person? What do you do? You try to be nice to them. What do they need? In the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> they need to actually be told they're actually quite angry and I'm not going to bend to you because you know you're, what you're doing is not nice. But you know what most of us finish up doing is we start saying to them the opposite. We start kowtowing, or I suppose you could call the, the term, to them, don't we? Yeah, or they get a devil. Or they get a devil. <laughs> but we either, usually we either avoid them completely, which is not loving in itself, or we go down the track of placating them, making them calm down by our actions, which is not being loving either. So why do we do that? Make more comfortable for ourselves. Exactly. Exactly. What we're avoiding is an emotion within ourselves. Can you see that? So every time we try to manipulate somebody or something in a situation on a soul level, we're actually avoiding an emotion within ourselves. It's really quite that simple. Yeah, so we act selfishly, fundamentally. Fundamentally, we're acting selfishly, which is not harmonious with love. And we need to allow ourselves to look at why. So, like, there's been many times where I've gotten into a situation of, of placating an angry person. So now I generally don't do that. Now what I say is, you're a very, very angry person. <laughs> and the truth is that I don't want to spend much time in your company while you're angry. Do you want to deal with what's underneath? Because I could talk about that with you. That'd be great. I'd love to do that. What happens when you do that? I've been in a situation where I've done that, <laughs> and it's caused confrontation. And you keep giving love and sending love, but they don't want that back. Do you just, are you best to avoid it? Well, there's two things happening, firstly. Firstly, there's an emotion in you that's attracted this unloving behaviour on their part. Mm. So what I've had to do myself is I've had to go into myself and say, all right, what's the emotion being triggered in me? Ah, it's this feeling in me that I have to actually make them feel better. So I'm feeling responsible. Now, I had to go right into some childhood issues and cry about all those issues, right, firstly. Once I did that, many of these angry people never even saw me again. And I didn't have to say anything to them at all. They just did not see me again. I had a period of uh, my time over the last five years, you know, saying that Jesus causes lots of different issues, mostly with other people. <laughs> and one thing that happened was that uh, sometimes there would be a lot of women coming along to groups. Like on, Sunday, uh, on Friday night, I think there were only five men there and the rest... 30 or so were women, right? So many of them again go home to their mates, to their partners, and start talking about all these wonderful things that they feel so enthusiastic about, and then they start connecting to some emotions, and their partners are not too impressed, right? Because their partner sees you change. And because I've, uh, many, my, my contact details are pretty easy to find out, so I often would get very abusive phone calls from men, right? This went on for nearly a year where I'd have men ringing me up, telling, swearing and cursing at me and telling me they'd kill me if they saw me and, and like really violent, really violent responses, right, from these men. And I can understand why the women are so afraid of them. And, and they just went on and on and on like that. They were writing letters to me and I'd, I'd, 
I, because my itinerary is pretty easily known as well, I would go to a new place and already there'd be a letter waiting for me there. Like, with all this swearing in it and I'm going to kill you and all this like, threatening stuff as well, right? So this happened. This went on going for four or five months. And, uh, and typical me, like I do with most things, is I avoid it for as long as possible. <laughs> do you do that too? <laughs> anyway, what I decided to do was just... Um, the one time, it, well, I, I picked up the phone and answered one to this man and he just went off and was swearing and saying how he's going to murder me if he, if he saw, you know, if I saw his family again. And, and mind you, he was a divorced man and he was talking about his divorced family, ironically. Right? So he wasn't even a part of the family that he was actually bringing me up about. And, and, um, and he was just swearing and abusive and, and just... And anyway, I just, I just said, look, I'm going to have to hang up and not hang up. And then, and then I just allowed myself to go into this fear that I was feeling about men being angry with me. And I went into some really deep causal things about my first century life group, you know, groups of people being, you know, angry with me to, to a life-threatening condition. And lots and lots of stuff came up for me. About, it took about a week of crying and and just doing some fear processing as well, which is a sort of like your body just shaking and, ter and feeling terrified all the time. And uh, after I did all that, I never had a single phone call again. These men are still angry at me, <coughs> uh, but they don't call me anymore. And I don't get any letters anymore. And they still know where I am, they still know my phone number and everything. But I just don't get it anymore. So what I had to do, in answer to your question, is first deal with my own emotion. When somebody's angry, we have such a tendency to say, it's their problem. Right? But it's not just their problem. We attracted this issue. Now when it comes to their anger, yes, they are angry because they are denying deeper things within them. <coughs> but this idea of sending love, if I can address that, you can't send love. You are either love or you are not love. Right now. You are either love or not love. Your soul is your condition. It's the I am condition. If I can explain it like that. I am right now feeling what? That's what's getting sent. So if you are right now feeling afraid, when you're, you know, if someone's yelling at you and you're afraid, what are you right now? Are you love? No. no. You are afraid. Feel it. Release it then you'll be love. Right? If you try, you see, the problem with a lot of these new age philosophies is they teach you to do things here, from here, ignoring that actually the truth is always coming from here. And we need to get out of the fact that we can create things here, and we need to get into the state where we create things here. Does that make sense? Into the state where we're creating things in the heart. So, right at that moment when someone is angry at you, if I'm afraid, own that fear, go into that fear, remove yourself perhaps from the situation, go into the fear, put yourself back in your imagination, write, do whatever it takes to connect to that fear. It's a childhood fear and you need to release it. When you release it, the moment you release it, you will be loved with that person. And they will feel it. You won't even have to say anything, they will automatically feel it, because now you are loved with that person. Before, you were fear with that person. And that's why they reacted the way they reacted. Now you'll be loved and their reaction will often change completely. Does that make sense to everyone? What's going on there? Yeah. Really important thing to understand. Every time you try to manufacture feelings towards other people, you will fail. Because you're breaking some laws. When you break laws, you will always fail. What are the laws? The laws are all based around the soul, what is really in your soul is what's getting sent to the universe. Not what you think is there. It's what is really there that gets sent to the universe. Yeah, even that's sort of selfish based really. You're wanting something for yourself. Even if you think it's a good thing you're projecting. It's yeah. not real. It's not real because what, why are you sending love? Because you want them to respond differently. Mm -hmm. is so that... you're wanting something for yourself. Exactly. Exactly. That's all you, is it, so is it love? No. No. It's just selfishness still. Mm. When you be love, now, now, automatically love is coming out of you 
for those people who are angry with you, and they will feel differently as a result. They will. Mm -hmm. Automatically, they will feel differently as a result. Love's not in time. Sorry? Love is not in time, in fact. No. Anything no. that comes from the mind is in time. That's right, yeah. So it's not a real love, it's just a, uh, a concept of what you think love is, which is incorrect. Exactly, exactly. And it's something you'll have to let go of. Yeah. Because you, because it is incorrect. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody said they've had a bereavement or something like that, yep. um, we've been sending them love, you know, warm, pink, fuzzy love. Um, in actual fact, what they... What do they need? Yeah. When we're not there, we're in the state. So Doesn't matter where you are, what do they need? They don't need to feel their pain. They need to grieve. Yeah. Why do they need to grieve? Because grief is false beliefs being now imposed upon that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. What are the false beliefs they have? They believe that a person's dead, they can't be contacted anymore. They believe there's all these different beliefs coming out in grief, right? Mm -hmm. They need to feel their grief. So my feelings are my prayer for them. When, when I feel for them, what I do is I feel a feeling towards God, saying, help them just stay connected with their grief until it's all gone. Until it's all gone. And that's my feeling towards them. Because that, that, that condition is going to be far better for them. So if you, if you happen to speak to them on the phone or something like that, you could say, well, you know, feel your grief. Go yeah, I encourage them to keep feeling, keep feeling. Mm -hmm. And I actually trigger their grief by talking about the person that they're grieving and talking about what it is that they feel they're missing, you know, in that process and go into that. With them. I know that's the areas that most of us skirt around, right? Yeah, might. <laughs> yeah, but, but I go into that with them because it's so important. There was a lady just recently in one group who just had a daughter, a 17-year-old daughter, commit suicide. And, and, and she was feeling, of course, lots of grief, right? And, and I've just continuously, continuously encouraged her to continually go back to what she's missing, what she's feeling, what's her feelings of responsibility. She feels responsible and lots of other things that were going on for her, this, this lady. And, and she's feeling it, to her credit, she's feeling those emotions. Well, most people would think you, you know, you're twisting the knife or pouring salt into an open wound or something, but mm. in actual fact it's beneficial. Yeah, very, very beneficial. Because mm. as she deals it, everyone else is saying, you should be over it now. It's about seven months ago. And, and, and you know, she's of course not feeling over it yet. Um, and they're telling her it should be over it. I'm saying, no, no, you don't need to be over this, you know. You don't need to be over this until all of this emotion is out of you. Then you're over it. Yeah, work, then work through it. Yeah, and, and, you know, I'll be around, you can talk to me anytime you want, as long as we're talking about that. Yeah. Like, I don't want to talk about superficial things or anything like that with you. I want to talk about what's really bothering you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hey Jack, if you just explain for me, my third daughter was three weeks late and wouldn't come, mm -hmm. and, um, and the doctor wouldn't do a cesarean because she knew that I'd had to normally, and it would be better for me not to. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that girl's now about uh, 40 something. <coughs> she herself has said to me, I know I didn't want to come, Mum. You know, why would you want to come into this? Mm -hmm. um, but yes, was there any reason for that soul not to like actually want to be born at that point? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, every single thing that happens, happens because of the soul choices that are going on at any one time. And yes, many, many children, many children miscarry because they don't want to be here. and They, they go into the environment, feel it, and don't want it. And so they don't want to be alive. You know, there's a terrible feeling that happened. When I was about six years old, I had some really terrible feelings that happened that created um, some pneumonia where, that I nearly died from. Um, because I just didn't want to be here. And this happens all the way through. So children have got illnesses that are related to, you know, not that are life-threatening. Most of them are related to the fact that they're feeling really, really uncomfortable in their life. Right? So, yeah, recognise that. Right the way through, not just at birth. Yeah. So, Jay, um, why do some people use either drugs or um, suicide as an option? What um, well, yeah, suicide and drugs probably different reasons. Uh, let's talk about suicide perhaps first, shall we? Um, suicide is usually made because we want to avoid our own emotion. So we get to a point where our emotions are so powerfully negative, like grieving type of emotions that we're not, we're not, we feel we're not allowed to feel, 
and usually that's due to projections of our family or, or friends or both, or our environment, that we feel we're not allowed to feel those emotions. And so we then make a choice to decide to die because we believe we're not going to feel our emotions when we die. Right? The truth is actually you will feel your emotions when you die. And it will be exactly the same emotions that you felt when you were alive. <coughs> because there is no saint seeing a death actually. See, there's a lot of concepts on the earth today about if I die, all of a sudden I become this enlightened being. That's not true. You become the person you were the moment before you died, just with a spirit body. That's what you become. Nothing else. You have exactly the same feelings, exactly the same thoughts, exactly the same beliefs, with a few modifications because now you know there's no death. <laughs> right? But you have exactly the same emotional condition. Are the memories still there? Everything's still there. Memories, oh, more, there'll be even more memories. Because <coughs> you'll remember all your sleep states at some point as well. Is yeah. still there? All of you, you will imagine yourself to continue to have these physical illnesses. You will imagine, I say imagine it, because it's your emotions that have created them. You don't have to cook, though, do you? You don't have to, yeah, there's a, there's a few changes. You don't have to cook, you don't have to clean. But lots of the girls felt that was good. <laughs> All those kind of things, right? And, but, that, but you will still be the same person, essentially, just without a physical form. And emotionally, you will certainly be the same person because the emotions are in the soul, which is the real you. So, when a person who suicides, suicides, often they're trying to get away from their emotions, and the end result is they actually feel more emotions plus, plus one additional emotion, which is a guilt about their own death. I had a free lunch. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lady who rang me about two weeks ago on the phone and she said, oh, I'm going to commit suicide tonight. And she was serious. And she said, uh, I just want, wanted to talk to you about what it's like on the other side. Wow. It was, she rang me because she wanted to have some reassurance about life on the other side. And I told her the truth about suicide. And that is, not only would she feel as bad as she's currently feeling, but she would have no one around her who could probably help her or she won't recognise that she's got people around her to help her. And on top of that, she's going to feel guilt about suicide. She had two children um, as well, uh, young children. And, uh, and so we discussed all of that. And what it got down to was this huge terror about feeling any of her own emotion. So that's the cause of suicide generally, this huge terror of feeling any of their own emotion. And the key... You can help the person who's suicided after they've passed quite a lot, as well as before they've passed. Uh, you can help them also not make the choice to suicide, but make a different choice. This lady uh, has made the choice now to actually feel all of her emotions. She rings me up quite terrified at times, but still is making the choice to feel her own emotions now. The emotions that she's denied, that she had denied, wanted to run away from. Now, there was a second half to your question there. Um, why do people choose drugs? Drugs, that's right. Um, so here's our soul. Soul is your... What is your soul? It's your passions. Experiences. Your desires. Emotions. Your emotions. These are all the things we've been talking about what the soul is, right? Mm -hmm. Intentions. All of your experiences, or you could call them your memories, or memory. they're all in your soul. The soul has free will. It also has love. All of us have some amount of love in our soul generally as well, right? That's our soul. Here's our soul. Now, what happens with our soul, obviously, is we receive different types of emotions. And we can classify some types of emotions as truth-based emotions. Love is a truth-based emotion. There are other ones like wisdom, power, joy. You know, there's lots of different truth-based emotions that go into our soul. There are also lots of different, what I call error-based emotions, or you could also call them fear-based emotions, right? And they are all the kind of emotions of unworthiness, emptiness, loneliness, all those kind of things enter our soul. 
Now, our souls, remember, have personality. And what I've generally found myself in terms of interaction with people is that there are people who are more naturally passionate than others. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. who, who are really, really sensitive to emotion, more sensitive, it seems, sometimes, than anyone else around them, right? And usually those people are also very, very sensitive to error entering them. Now, the error, remember, enters you, particularly during the from the time you're reincarnated and through your childhood in particular, right? That's when the error enters you. And then you start acting upon the error and creating more error. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the causal error, the real guts of the stuff, usually happens during our own childhood. Now, as that enters us, if our personality is a very sensitive or passionate personality, we will try to come up with different ways to cope with that error, to cope with it emotionally. And one of those things that we'll do is we'll turn to different forms of denial. Now, there are society, from a society's perspective, there are forms of denial that are acceptable. But being busy is one of them. Right? Busy your life, that's acceptable. That's an acceptable form of denial. What are other acceptable forms of denial that we use nowadays, do you think? Sorry? Entertainment. Entertainment, yeah. So I get involved in entertaining myself all the time. You know, movies, DVDs, going out, you know. All just keeping myself busy with entertainment. What is another form of success? Success, yeah. yeah. Right. What did somebody else say? I was just going to say, try to excel in some. Yeah, excelling. Yeah. You know, making yourself excel. That's that's acceptable form of denial. Right. What are the non-acceptable forms of denial with our society today? Drugs. Drugs. <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> sex. Gambling. Gambling. <laughs> Laziness. Right. Can you see what's happening is we are actually judging the forms of denial. Now, when a child grows up with lots of judgment about forms of denial, they split into two categories. They rebel or they follow the judgment. They go along with the judgment. So they will either go down the rebellious path, and some of you have done that in your own life, right? Absolutely. Go down the rebellious path of forms of denial, and some of you have also gone down this path of acceptable forms of denial. And our children do this all the time. And more and more our children are choosing non-conforming forms of denial. Wow. Yes. Uh, and the reason why is because we are trying, because of our own denial, so all forms of abuse began during the childhood, all forms of abuse of drugs, alcohol and those kind of things began while our children were, were little and we have imposed certain forms of denial upon them that they have either accepted and in the case of that busied themselves and done all the things we've done or rejected, right? which they've then gone down the track of doing the opposite things, drugs, alcohol, abuse, sex, whatever. Right? The key for us is to see them all as the same, without judgment. To see them all just as forms of denial, of underlying emotion that we need to experience. What about the use of drugs in shamanistic culture, etc., where they're used to break through emotional blocks or mind things to, to get to the spiritual understanding? Yeah, I know that they, uh, that's the thought that they are used for. Um, the truth is actually quite different when you look at what's happening at the spirit body level. At the spirit body level, when you take anything that modifies and that, that, that is dealing with emotional substances, what actually happens in your spirit body when you take drugs, even just marijuana, I don't know this might upset a few of you, there, there is a modification of the energy flow in your spirit form because it changes the way your spirit form copes with energy flowing within it. And my suggestion is just my, my suggestion is to avoid all of those things and look at the underlying emotional reason why you're reaching for that particular substance. Now a lot of the so-called shamanistic culture is is treated as a developed culture, but in reality, in the spirit world, it has a lot of roots in some very dark emotions. 
And so many of the spirits who are connected with these people are in a dark place, actually, and wanting drugs in order to still look after some of their own emotions. And so there's a very strong spirit connection with drugs. For that reason, many people who take drugs uh, when they're very young go into schizophrenic stages. Mm -hmm. What that stage is, is actually a spirit. When you're in a, in a drug state, a spirit is it can more easily take over your your body, if you like, and your, and your mind, and you enter a relationship with the spirit on a fairly permanent basis. So there are a lot of illnesses today that are actually related to what dr a drug does to your body and how it opens you up spiritually, and then how it connects you with the spirit. And most of the time the spirits that are connecting to those, to those um, emotions are spirits who are already in quite a poor emotional state themselves. Does that make sense? Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, with the epidemic of depression that's going on, is that a result of the environmental factors and the state of the world, or do you think it's more a factor of people dealing with a lot of emotional stuff coming up? Yeah. It's all the emotions. Uh, yeah. It's all the emotions. Everything, even epidemics are all based on... What a lot of epidemics are based on is that collectively as a human race, we often have a similar emotional condition to our neighbour. So when, once a certain type of illness starts spreading, of course it's going to spread very rapidly because we all have the same emotional injury that prevents our body from rejecting that particular illness or disease. And so this is how big diseases spread quite rapidly because we all have very, very similar emotions that we're not dealing with. Yeah. Just something that happened to me is I used to get sick every single month for one week on the average every single month. <laughs> from the time I was born to the time I was 33 years old. You know? The moment I began dealing with my emotions, for the next seven years I didn't get sick at all. It just happened like that. Just went from emotional process, no emotional processing to emotional processing, and I didn't get sick for seven years, and yet I've been sick every month before that. Then when I started the Divine Love Path, I got sick very intensely for a couple of weeks. Right? And what I'm noticing now within myself is that the <coughs> instant I deny an emotion is the instant my body complains at me about my denial. Mm -hmm. So instead of there being a delay like there used to be, now it's instant. As soon as I deny something, that happens. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a few months ago, I was denying some emotions about how I was feeling about women, and my thumb just split open by itself and started bleeding. Just had a big split down and some there's some recordings you'll see where I've wrapped it up with a band-aid <laughs> because it just started bleeding by itself. My thumb went hard and then just cracked open and then just started bleeding. Mm -hmm. Once I worked through the emotions, within a day it had healed. Right? But it stayed that way bleeding for four months while I didn't deal with those emotions. Yeah. Just stuff like that happens to my body all the time. Yeah. It's interesting, AJ, because I've noticed that my feet um, at the night time for the last month particularly, that just at the night time they split open and they crack and they bleed and it's like I have no, you know, it's like I can't even, couldn't work that out if I tried. I put socks on and put balm on them and it's like yep. every night it's the same thing and it doesn't happen in the day, yep. but it's like night time and they're intensely painful, hot, Yep. Split open. Yep. So you think it's the emotion? I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> right. it, it is emotions. Is it one foot worse than the other? If I have to say, I'd probably say the right foot. Yep. Um, I mentioned the book yesterday, Emotions of the Brother of the Soul, um, yeah. by Anne Mitchell. Body is a brother. Uh, the body is a brother. So, the brother, yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, and yeah, um, if you get that book in there, it'll help you trace what's happening with each foot, each toe, even, um, and and it will link it back to some emotions. Um, but um, it presents them in a very intellectual way sometimes, so it doesn't doesn't sometimes help very much in that regard. But, but it, is, it does demonstrate the relationship between emotions you're denying 
and the physical symptoms that occur. And that's, that's exactly correct. And what, what I noticed too about a month ago in the left thumb and the meaty part here in the wrist, this intense pain just came out of nowhere. And uh, I've actually had to give up work because I, I, I used to work at the yeah. renal dialysis unit and I couldn't join the tubing. Right. And, and I couldn't even pick up the bit of paper, but this intense pain, and as I've been working through some emotions, it's, it's, it's subsided. subsided. But what I've noticed is my husband on Friday, he's got this same intense pain yeah. that he now can't do anything with this. Yeah. And a lot of you may find that happening on a periodic basis where all of a sudden you have this intense pain or something's going on. And this is happening in the world in the world today, by the way. A lot of the world changes are being changed because of these things happening and people wanting to address them. But what's if we just can there's some events that happened a month ago in in particular that triggered some emotions for you. A lot of these things started happening a month ago, right? Yeah. So something else could happen. The workplace. The workplace is where I actually felt it manifesting this um, some sort of hostility, some sort of bullying. This bullying thing came up in the workplace. Okay. And and how do you feel about that? Because it's an emotion you're denying about that. Yeah. Um, well, I can see they're bullying, but I'm I'm sort of I know it's over here. And. See, uh, this relates to the question you asked earlier about anger. Um, see, when somebody else sort of torments us or bullies us or pushes yeah. us around, we often tell ourselves that I'm more spiritually developed than that and I'm not going to get angry. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get upset and I'm going to deal with this in a more calm and loving manner and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, inside of us, oh. there's some other emotions going on that we're not allowing to flow. Yes. You follow me? Yes. And you need to start letting those emotions flow. Mm. Mm. And I did that just very yesterday and I saw a different scenario play out. So yeah. that was very pleasant. Yeah. And so. you'll, see, you'll see that happen more often if you just connect with some of those other emotions, which are the, the are angry based emotions where you feel judgment and you know, towards others who do those things and all those kind of things. Let yourself work your way through those. Let yourself have that anger. You don't have to project it at the people. You need to actually own it and have it yourself, that's what I mean. Yeah. At the moment you're projecting it, right. when you don't own it. Mm -hmm. See, if, if that's something mm -hmm. everyone can understand, mm -hmm. when you don't own your emotion, you are automatically projecting it. The instant you own it, even just, even if you just recognise, even if you just say to yourself, I have this emotion, straight away there's less projection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Straight away. As soon as you even just do that, there's less projection. But even better than that is if you experience it so it's no longer in you, There'll be no projection. Mm. Right? So at the moment, yeah, if you can just own some of those anger-based emotions, you'll find a lot of these extremity issues will disappear for you. Oh, good. So and that's probably coming from that bullying, that childhood bullying stuff, the bullying, the male bullying the little girl. Very much so. Yeah. yeah very much mm. so. Yeah. Oh, a lot of times we know what they're at, what it all is all about. We just don't want to feel the emotion. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So you've just got to give it your full attention and you get through it quicker. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, all you need to do is sit down for five minutes and just write down what, something about it, and before you know it, you've found the answer. It's just before then, you just want to stay away from the answer. That's it. That's often what's happening. Yeah. So hearing and eyesight, similar? Hearing and eyesight, yeah. Eyesight, in my case, my eyesight's all about something I don't want to see in the distance. <laughs> So I've got short-sightedness at the moment. And it's about not wanting to see some big picture events in the distance, and I know what they are, yeah. <laughs> which I don't want to see them. Um, We've suddenly gone deaf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hearing hearing is all about, um, you know, not wanting, usually not wanting to hear truth. Because we have a lot of self-shame or self-judgment about the truth when it hits us, so we don't want to hear it. Right? Problems here with the throat is often about not wanting to speak truth, feeling ashamed of speaking truth, or feeling like you're going to get punished if you speak truth. All of those feeling like you're going to lose something if you speak truth. That's all problems in this area. So you know when you cough and <coughs> you can't seem to clear everything. A lot of it's about what's happening with truth. 
problems through the chest here. Most of it's about grief. Heart attacks are about grief. Yeah. Problems with the mind are about generally about what you don't want to remember. Uh, so think, trying to force yourself out of remembering things. Problems with this area of your stomach, the upper area, gallbladder area around that area, all the, and the feelings of sickness that you may feel in that area are all about your fears generally. Problems in the next day, chakra down, in the area of your, of your stomach digestion, problems with digestion, food processing, all those kind of things, all in that region, are often about sexual identity and often to do with a lot of shame and unworthy feelings in there. Problems, problems lower down with the sex organs themselves and all that related to the first and second chakra areas are often to do with sexual identity. So, you know, Problems like cancers often are about giving or not wanting to give. Uh, giving too much or not wanting to give at all. There's lots and lots of different diseases that are all related to all different types of things. And the key for us is to just feel the emotion. Feel the emotion and it will just go away. So I've had all sorts of things go away. What about dozing off? Uh, well, what do you reckon that might be about? Yeah, just keep waking me up. Yeah, what's it about? You know what's about? Don't want to face it. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. Sorry? Cup of tea. Cup of tea, what's having, if you deny it was a cup of tea all the time, what's that about? Just. What do you reckon it might be? Avoidance. Avoidance? It is avoidance, but what were you denying? What do you feel? The, cute, the feeling is what do you get from these denials? What do you get from them? Comfort. Comfort. Okay, cup of tea time, comfort time. This is a bit of self time, feels good, warms you up, all that stuff. Why do you need all that? Because you don't feel secure, you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel those things. That's what that's what that's about. Shall I put the pot on? You want to put the pot on for everyone? Um, well, you want, we want to finish at one, so I don't know if we have time, if you want to have a break or... Well, I was we'll thinking maybe of even finishing earlier. Uh, what's the time now? Okay. Yeah, past oh, Yeah, I'm happy to finish when you are. If, uh, if you've had enough and you feel like a cuppa or whatever else, then something, I'm happy to finish whenever you want. Yeah, we're we're yes. Another couple of questions? <laughs> Another couple of questions? You've been patient. <laughs> Fire away. Uh, you've rekindled or, <coughs> or reawakened an idea you were teaching us of my desire to be close to God, the desire. I believe it's actually an awakening. Yeah. And uh, just an intellectual question. Yeah. Uh, that desire, now how much influence is that desire coming from the soul, the spiritual body, my mind, the tool, and also outside spiritual influences? And so your, soul, your soul controls all of your desire. So right. that desire of mine is coming directly from the soul. Yep. Nothing to do with my intellect. And no, nothing to do with the intellect. Your intellect is responding to the desire and causing you to choose things as a result of that desire. The desire, desire is a very, very powerful thing. And one, one thing I'd like to say to all of you, in fact, is that you, if you find you can live a life where you're always in your desire, you'll find your life change so rapidly that you'll have, you'll have trouble keeping up with it and it will change for the better in every case if you, if you do this. Just let yourself follow your passions and desires. Right? Now, most people don't and most of the denials that come up, so there's other emotions that often interfere with desire and they're also in the soul. The emotions that in interfere with desire are usually all fear-based emotions. Right? So if I just simplify that for you, let's say I'm over here on the roof and over there I see somebody, a girl, like I'm a guy, I see a girl that I really like and I like to get to know, you know, this is me with Mary. <laughs> what happens is I take some steps towards her and what happens? Yeah. Start, some, some things start creeping in, don't they? Mm -hmm. Now, what, any of my fears, look, it might be the first thing might creep in, might be the fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. Right? So once the fear of rejection kicks in, what is my desire now? To run. My desire is actually, yeah, is actually, uh, uh, it might freeze me, or it might actually, no, no, I can't do that, you know, and I'll go somewhere else. Might, might not. So what interferes with pure desire 
is emotional injuries within me that are all based around my fears. This is why a fear list is so important. Because a fear list helps you identify all the areas where you're not allowing your desire. You follow me? So, your desire is, is pure. The key now is keeping it pure by allowing yourself to address all of your fears that prevent that desire from being realized. Does that make sense? So, so when I'm walking towards this woman, I'm actually, every t close step closer I'm getting, I'm confronting another fear. Right? And I need to feel my fears and I need to allow myself to experience them. When I first saw Mary, I was so afraid that I couldn't actually speak to her or look into her eyes. So she was wanting to talk to me. <laughs> and I always was looking away. Like, and she thought, what's wrong with this guy? Like, There's something major wrong with this guy. Like, I don't know why my parents like him so much. He's always not looking at me. <laughs> and the reason why is I, I was afraid of looking at her eyes because I felt if I looked at her eyes, she'd know straight away what I was feeling for her. And I was, I was ashamed of letting her know what I was feeling for her. And so I wouldn't look at her. So what was kicking in there? Another fear that I had to work my way through. My desire at that point was not pure anymore. It was modified by my emotional fears that had entered my soul. So I've found in, my, in, in, in a lot of cases, I've, like even doing groups like this, I've had lots of fears about, about that, obviously. And I've had to work through lots of issues about saying I'm Jesus to somebody. Right? They were, so I have a desire, passions, and then some fears that kick in every time, and I have to confront those. Right? So what we need to do is, is learn to live in this place and learn to actually feel and release all of these. Yeah. And if you can do that at the same time, you'll find that your life becomes very joyous. What a lot of people do though, is they forget all about their desires and just concentrate on dealing with all their fears. And you can get in a really dark place quite quickly doing that. So this doesn't have to be a, a joyless experience, you know. It can be a very joyful experience growing, as long as you remain connected to your desires. What if your fears are blocked off all your desires for so long that you then don't of even course know? You're... And then you do go into this place where you, it almost feels like you can't move or can't do anything, you're overwhelmed, and, and yeah. nothing seems to be able to trigger any sort of... My, Mary feels that way right at the moment, actually. You know, my Mary feels that she doesn't know what she desires. And a lot of people have got to that point. And you know, one of the main reasons why is because in the past when we had a desire, it was never fulfilled. Right? So what happens when desires are never fulfilled? We become feeling a, a feeling of hopelessness. Right? And that often shuts us down quite a lot too. In those cases, you will need to firstly feel those feelings before you will experience your desires. But if you do notice your desires right now, then start connecting to them straight away. But if you're not even noticing your desires yet, then start addressing your fears. Because your fears are covering over your desires. Yeah. And that's a really important thing to be in mind of. Is there a place for the warrior personality? Warrior personality. <laughs> the fighter, the fighter for a good cause. Um, uh, bluntly, no. <laughs> the reason why emotionally. In the end, when you have dealt with all of the emotions within you, what happens is everything automatically comes to you that you want. So you don't have to fight to get what you want. Everything is automatically presented to you on a platter. So even though what you want is not for yourself, as you perceive it anyway, it's for the good of the whole, or the, the trees, or the birds, or the kangaroos, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Same thing applies? If I'm wanting to fight for it, then it is about myself. Ah. Right. Even though I'm telling myself that it's for that out there. Yep. Ah. It's about myself and an emotion, an unrealised emotion within myself that I don't want to experience. Mm -hmm. But don't you have to be noble and courageous about what you want? <laughs> uh, there's a difference between noble and courageous about something. Yeah, well, you, yeah, totally. that's what I'm saying. You will need to be very brave yeah. to actually yeah. live in truth, in, particularly in this world. Later down the track, you won't have to be brave at all. It would be an automatic process. Yeah. 
But right now, yes, you will have to be brave and courageous to live in the world and be completely the, the kind of person that I'm describing. Yeah. Certainly. And, and care about um, not confusing <coughs> desire with a selfish want. Yes. The, and also, like, the truth is you, can, you will still care passionately about everything, but you won't want to fight for it. The desire to fight for it is driven by an emotion within you. And it comes from your childhood. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Well, it, it sort of is a bit of a fight to overcome your denial about facing your. Oh, true. I'm not. I'm not talking about the fight of the soul. No. Uh, every one of you has a major war or battle going on in yeah. you at the moment, and that that is what I would call the battle of the soul. That's the only war that you will ever need to fight, and it's the war between you trying to run away from your emotions and trying to run towards them. Absolutely. And that, that battle is an internal battle that you will need to have courage to face. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Mm. Near-death experiences, are they a fallacy or is it a true thing? No, they're real. They're real events. Oh, good. Every time you have a near-death experience, and hopefully you don't have too many of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> but many of them are very pleasant, right? Mm. And most of them are. The reason why is what happens when you're in a near-death state, your spirit and material, your, your soul and your spirit body leaves your material body. There's a silver cord connection that's maintained between your bodies. And until that material body actually physically dies, that silver cord connection remains in place. But you now have a major consciousness coming through your spirit body senses. Your spirit body has eyes, ears, has all of those senses that the material body has and more. And it, it begins to absorb what's really going on through its spirit senses rather than the physical senses. So what you're actually doing is experiencing uh, some actual things going on in your so-called sleep state, if we could call it that. And you are seeing them because you're awake now. You're, now, if the body dies, then the silver cord will snap and you'll never be able to enter that body again. Right? But if the body remains alive and the silver, silver cord remains in place, then you will eventually come back into the body and remember those experiences. Oh, okay. yeah. And so that's why there are like there are literally millions of people mm. having out of body experiences and near death experiences. Yeah. It brings me to organ transplant. Yep. Um, what happens there if you have your organs transplanted? How long does your silver cord stay intact? Um, all these. Well, yeah, is it this is. It's the right thing, or is it? Yeah, this is where it's really important for a lot of the medical profession to come to come to know the truth about the body, right, and the soul, because you can actually tell once you're sensitive, you can tell when the cord is snapped, and as soon as that cord is snapped, that body can be used for anything, pretty much, can't it? Mm -hmm. like, it's no longer needed for the person who's. Only, they've only got so long to actually... I realise that. Attempt, though, so that's where the... Yeah, that, that's and this is where the ethical problems relate, is yeah. that quite often a, a body is in a state which you could call, call suspended animation type state, but the silver cord is yet to snap. And mm -hmm. um, all of you have heard of the resurrection of Lazarus in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Well, what happened there was he's, he, he was in a suspended animation type state, but his silver cord, the silver cord had not snapped between his body and, and his spirit body. And that's why I managed to so-called resurrect him. You can't resurrect anybody if their silver cord is snapped. Right? So, so if the silver cord snaps, then anything in that body is usable. Right? But, but if, if, if I'm trying to make the silver cord snap as a doctor to get some harvest of something else, then there's actually some emotional penalties on my soul where I'm breaking some laws of God doing that. And what about the actual soul if the silver cord is still attached and the, you know, they are um, housed? Does that affect the, the soul in any fear of physics? Well, if the silver cord remains intact, it's because the soul at some level wants that to remain intact mm. if the body itself is in this sort of state of suspended animation. Mm. So everything is based upon the free will of the soul. So if somebody goes along and then kills the body, mm. then what they're actually doing is breaking a law of free will for that particular person. Now it doesn't impact the person too much perhaps in some instances, but in some instances if they have a strong desire to return to earth, it could impact them upon them greatly. 
And so there are many people who pass into the spirit world who have this strong feeling that they, that they should have been alive still. And they have this strong feeling too that uh, the person, they have some strong anger towards doctors and stuff like that who have actually caused their premature death. Or the other way around sometimes too. A strong anger towards ones who have, who have tried to halt their death when they really wanted to go. And so the key is you know, understanding the free will of the person. And this is where mediums and everyone can do a lot of, lot more clever work, really, in a lot of ways. Rather than just channeling information to a person sitting in front of them, what they could even do is sit in a hospital and things like that and ask the person who's in this state, what do they want? Do they want to leave their body or do they want to keep it here? What do they want? You know, and talk to them, talk them through that process and help them come to realise whether they want to come back or they want to go. I had, uh, I think I mentioned so, uh, Friday night, didn't I, about John who died. My, my best friend uh, is the Apostle John and he, he was, he's one of the 14 who have returned. And he died 18 months ago, he was murdered. And uh, there were, there's a period of four days between him being stabbed and when he actually passed. And during those four days I was talking with him about all sorts of issues which he was finding difficult to actually deal with. What happened was that on the first day of his stabbing and the day after, he was in really quite a good condition and everybody thought that he would be fine. On the second day, there was an event that happened in his home that he saw occurring in his sleep state that really badly affected him emotionally. What happened was, in his, while he was in the unconscious state, he was out of body, he was visiting his own home and his parents and his brothers were ransacking his home as if he'd already died. Oh, no. And, and he had such a big response to that emotionally, and ironically it was the same, those same emotions that caused his stabbing, his avoidance of those emotions. But he had such a big response to that emotionally that he no longer wanted to live on earth. Before then he was wanting to, and at that point he just didn't want to anymore. He just felt there was nobody on earth who loved him, which was the emotion that he was avoiding before then. And, uh, and because of that, his bowel in his body died, died within one day. And, uh, and because of that, he, he passed yeah, through a few days later. So, so a lot of these things happen emotionally, you know, uh, even, even the person passing. They, a lot of people in the sleep state or in, the, in an unconscious state see the real thoughts of those around them and are so distressed by those real thoughts and feelings that they want to just go. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of things affecting this process of passing. Jay, could that also affect an unborn child? My um, step-grandson and granddaughter, the baby was um, still born at six weeks. Yeah. Absolutely perfect, and they said that it was possibly a blood clot in the... Um, placenta, it was the wrong colour when he was actually born. Yeah. Now I could see the child and he was absolutely beautiful and I could describe him to my own daughter mm -hmm. who saw him, mm -hmm. um, but her mother is extremely an angry, extremely angry person and Kathleen, the mother of the baby, uh, has had a fairly traumatic life because of her stepmother. Yeah. And it's her stepmother that's so angry. Yeah. Um, she performed, the, the grandmother performed in the hospital, she was an absolute pain, yeah. um, I believe. But yes, but would that child have sent, already known um, what he was coming into? Yes, a, a, a child at those age, but they don't know in, a, as, a, in as much as a conscious way, no. but rather in an emotional way. <coughs> so, so when they're at that development, like John could actually, when John, because John was a grown man, he could actually go there, see what was going on, see the actual feelings and thoughts going on in each person, and actually consciously see, and, and it just hit him all of a sudden with his own emotional condition, what was going on. Whereas if a child saw the same event, they would just feel the emotions of the people involved. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they would respond emotionally based on that, because their intellect as yet has not really developed. Yeah. You were saying about suicide before as not being being a murder. What about assisted suicide where somebody really genuinely has had a long life in a lot of pain and things? Is that different to 
the suicide of emotional, I know it's emotional burdens that have caused the illness exactly. or whatever. So we need to address what the causes are. old age, you know, and things. Yeah, but no, we need to address what the causes are. The causes of somebody wanting to suicide are very much used, and feeling in pain before them generally, are very much due to their law of attraction. And so we need to acknowledge that initially. If we acknowledge that, um, and we also understood the sanctity of life from God's perspective, we wouldn't assist somebody to suicide. But, again, I'm not saying don't do it. What I'm saying is look at the emotional reasons why you want to do it. Look at the emotional reasons why the person themselves wants to do it and wants to get you to help them. Now, that's a bit different than assisting someone to stay alive. A lot of times in the medical profession today, we try to assist someone to stay alive and really, if we let them, if we let things happen naturally, due to the law of attraction, they would probably pass a lot sooner. Yeah. And that's a lot different situation than actually Which is usually assisting where suicide. What's happening along with the ones who want assisted suicide quite often? Oftentimes, yes. Oftentimes, these ones who want assisted suicide are often being kept alive without their consent. Mm -hmm. And any time you harm the free will of another person, you are actually breaking the law. So, in other words, if, if somebody wants to commit suicide right in front of me, if I try to prevent them through my own actions, aside from my words and trying to reason with them, if I try to prevent them with my own actions, then I'm actually breaking a law. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So if I went and jumped on them and tied them around and said, you're not going, I'm actually breaking a law, mm. a law of free will. They have the, they have the free will. They're allowed to decide what, they're going, what they want to decide. Obviously, I'll do everything I can not to breaking the law it, yeah. to get them to not do it, including tell them the truth about what will happen after they've done it, mm. which often is the thing that stops them from doing it in most cases. Mm. Just That's right. Right. But I was just um, wondering about what you were saying about when you do die, you still have those emotions to deal with. Why is it then, if you have a near-death experience, everyone says that, that they experience bliss and love and and white light and it's better than they, anything they've ever known on earth. Is because that just a temporary thing and then you go into your spirit body and you feel... There's two reasons why. One is that the spirits who are with you are often really nursing you through the process of transition. And so what they're doing is they're trying to prevent any painful experiences at the time of transition. It's very important that they try to do that just to assist you to come to terms with a new state if you are going to pass. The second thing is that your soul condition draws you to a place in the spirit world where, where you have certain feelings and emotions. And oftentimes when you are disconnected from your body, what happens is you have a light feeling and then you also go to a place like in the spirit world, even in this, in the, in this, in this state of the near-death experience, where spirits are surrounding you who will nurse you through the next process. And the next process is coming to an awareness of where you are. Now that process is usually done in a location in the spirit world that is very neutral. In it. When I say neutral, it's full of love and not full of lots of negative emotions. What happens then, and you can read these experiences quite a lot where a person passes and they channel information. What happens if they pass, initially the first few, you know, what feels to them to be days or even months, and sometimes it can be even years, depending on what state their body was in, they will remain in a place like a nursing home, if you like, in, a, in, a, in good surroundings, in nice peaceful surroundings where they feel lots of blissful emotions, until such time as they become aware and awake to what's going on. At that point in time, there's a law that kicks into action, which is a law of attraction, based on the soul condition attracted to a soul location. And they have to go to that new soul location whatever that soul location is. So every person on passing generally at the par point of passing usually has quite good experiences. Not all the times, but usually has quite good experiences. But shortly after the point of passing, their soul attracts them to a location where they, where their, you could say their karma, their law of compensation begins. Yeah. So, so where you know they can't, they're brought confronted face to face with themselves. So the near death experience is a temporary experience, um, and the and the passing experience is a temporary experience, 
and all of us at some point when we pass will experience it differently depending on what we're ready for at the soul condition yeah, in our emotions yeah. so you imagine if you had no spiritual conceptions whatsoever you've never learned anything about any of these spiritual conceptions whatsoever the instant you pass one of the first shocks will be that you're oh, it's still alive <laughs> And after that, the next thing that you will start doing is, what in the hell do I do now? <laughs> like, all of the things that I believed in, all of the things that I've ever done all my life, that I've put all my energy, my desire, my time and effort into, have all just gone in one instant. What do I do? And obviously you're going to need some help, right, through that transition phase. So there are lots of spirits available to help people in that transition phase. But often, the people themselves don't accept that help. So there's lots of help available right at the transition phase, but many people don't accept the help even right at the transition phase. And that's why many spirits are earthbound. You heard that term? Mm -hmm. Earthbound spirits are spirits who don't want to accept any help about the transition phase, and they still believe themselves to be here on earth. And you'll have spirits even in your own... If you had a house where somebody died, and then you went to go to the house, sometimes you might even feel them in the house. And the reason why is because they don't believe they've died. And like, they might start causing trouble to you even, trying to kick you out of their house because they still think it's their house. You follow me? So how can they be helped? Or can, can they be helped? Yeah, yeah. easily. Just, just, by, just by talking to them about the fact that they have actually died, we, that you can't see them, but you can feel them around. You can't mm -hmm. see them. They have actually died, and all they need to do, there's some spirits around them who want, who want to help them, and all they need to do is talk to them, and they'll be helped. Right? But a lot of people don't want to acknowledge they've even passed. So there's ones who haven't acknowledged for hundreds of years that they've not passed. That was in a coma, and people would come from the state and he was supposed to have died, um, kept prolonging it. He is a stubborn, was a stubborn bugger. And, um, I went into him and just said, Don't you believe in, in God and in heaven and the rest of it? Just uh, yeah, show your faith that you've always professed and you're gone. And let yourself go. Yeah. Is that what happened? Yeah. It's gone. Often we need to go. He needed that. He needed that. Yeah. Because it, what was keeping him there was his fear. A lot of times what happens is we, in the sleep state, in that spirit state, that near death state, we're so afraid to go wherever it is we're going to go because we don't know anything about it or we don't you know, feel anything about it that we try to stay connected with the body, connected with my life, connected with my body, connected with my life, refusing to give up. And that just prolongs the connection between the bodies. Isn't it also sometimes the people around them, their fear or Very their attachment, so. their attachment yeah. to that person? Yeah, your attachment to a person can keep them there for ages when they, when they don't need to be there. Um, and they'll feel it from an emotional perspective, not an intellectual one. Mm -hmm. right. mm. My mother's belief is that she will just go to sleep and be asleep. And I've heard others and you told that in the church, that you'll pass and you'll just go to sleep. Just so sleep. is that what, do they sleep? And many of them sleep for a long time. They believe. They yeah, they believe that and they sleep for a long time, sometimes years of our time, mm -hmm. that they are asleep in the spirit world, in, that, mm -hmm. in the sort of a hospitalised state, if mm -hmm. you like, and then they wake up. Fresh? Uh, they wake up quite fresh, <laughs> yes, but with exactly the same emotional beliefs they had before they passed. Sure. So, so yeah, they still have all those issues to do with the jails. Are you currently in the seventh sphere? Uh, for myself, yeah. 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 I still haven't made the transition into a moment because of these emotions I'm still working through. I've been in the seventh sphere now for nearly two and a half years. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting exhausted with it. <laughs> not, not exhausted with being in the seventh year, but exhausted with these emotions that keep popping up that I was unaware of just you know, moments before. Yeah. So I just ask you, with suicide, where you're going to, um, my friend's son, but he, at, they didn't realise at the time that he was diagnosed with schizophrenic, yeah. and he was going to kill him. But they tied him to the chair and stopped him. So you were saying not to stop somebody committing a suicide, but in that case, or cases like that? Um, see, what really needs to be addressed is the spirit influence. Mm -hmm. So if the spirit influence was addressed, he wouldn't have wanted to commit suicide. No, but it wasn't 
at that time. Mm. So this, see, this is the problem, is because we don't know the truth, we start doing other things, mm -hmm. not knowing the truth of what we're doing either. See, if we knew the truth, then, like you've asked me what's the appropriate thing to do, oh. the appropriate thing to do would have been, he had schizophrenia, he needed to address the issue of the spirit attraction. <coughs> now, if he had helped, been helped to do that, the spirit would never have got to the condition where he could influence him to try to commit suicide. And it would never have happened. So how could God manifest? All you need to do is talk to the spirit. Yeah. And and talk to the person as well, of course. Because there's an attraction between the two. The same with manic depression. You've heard of manic depression. <laughs> manic depression is a similar state. Um, manic, the manic highs are due to spirit spirit heavy spirit influence. The manic lows are due to the spirits not being able to maintain influence anymore because the body's so depleted. And so the body just goes bang. Right. Uh, big 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 blackout on the body. And so and then the cycle continues because the person attracts it, they feel powerless and they want to feel powerful. So a lot of manic depressive people are addicted to the high. Mm -hmm. They're addicted to the feeling of powerfulness. And they don't want to feel their powerlessness. And that encourages spirits who want to also feel the same feelings through them on the earth as well. And that's why in their highs they do strange things sometimes. You know, I knew one man who could have, he was 66 and he could walk around on his hands all day. Now obviously when he came down off of that his shoulders killed him for, for months. Because <laughs> right? it was the spirits doing that and keeping him in that state, you see. But he could do that all day. Um, so is all schizophrenia um, caused by other spirits? All schizophrenia is, is spirit influence. In fact, almost all so-called mental illnesses, aside from depression, mm -hmm. depression is a bit different, but all kinds of mental illnesses are due to spirit influence. So you've healed some of these cases with schizophrenia? It's really easy to heal them, yeah. For us to do that? Yeah. All of you have the opportunity to do that. You just need to acknowledge the spirits there. And see, a lot of times, what, what does the medical profession do with the schizophrenic? They say, these voices aren't in your head. They are caused by your brain doing something that we don't know. Which is the opposite of the truth. These voices are in their head, and they are caused by some real people who are connected to them. Do you follow me? Now, if they were acknowledged in that way even, the whole outcome would be quite different. Right? It would have to scare them for quite a while, though. How would you? Not necessarily. If you are, if you explained it in a calm way and with love, like how? Why would it? Why would it be a frightening thing? All of us have spirits around us. I just explained that yesterday, right? All of us have hundreds of spirits around us at any time. They've just got some that are in their head all the time, because they're mediumistic in many cases. They actually are. They're actually got some abilities, natural abilities that we don't have. And they're mediumistic, and all we need to do is encourage them to show them how to use that skill, use that ability they have, you know, and not be afraid of it, and not, you know, not try to get away from it. A lot of them go to the drugs to get away from the mediumistic ability, which actually attracts even darker spirits. So you get this cycle happening where they don't feel they can speak openly and honestly to people because if they do, everyone will say they're crazy. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, you can talk with spirits, and these people are talking with spirits all day in most cases. You know, quite often I see older people walking along the road who are so-called schizophrenic, nattering away to themselves. No, no, you know, talking as if somebody else is there. There are more than one person there with them, and you can feel them and see them if you if you develop those abilities. And you can talk to those spirits and say, you know, hang on a sec, this is very nice, what are you going to mean to this person? You know, and you can talk to them about all of those kind of things. Yeah, most of these things, like lots of illnesses too, are caused by spirit attachment. Lots of cancers in children are caused by spirit attachment to children. Lots of cancers, uh, uh, lots of illnesses like diabetes are caused by spirit attachment. Right. Can they do it at a distance? Sorry? Yeah. Speak to them at a distance? Yeah, well, there's no distance for them, for the spirit. You can start talking to the spirit. Hang on a sec, you know, what you're doing here is. You know, it's not very good, really, what you're doing here. You're damaging this person's body. You know, a lot of them don't even know they're in somebody else's body. A lot of them are so bound to the earth, they want to keep experiencing the earth, they'll do anything to stay here, including in trying to inhabit somebody else's body. Now, if we're asking the spirits to leave in somebody else's body, do we need to 
Well, well, the first thing we need to respect is that the person has a law of attraction yeah. and the spirit has a law of attraction. So my suggestion is we don't ask them to leave the body. I never ask them to leave. Mm -hmm. I tell them what they're doing. Tell, just tell them the truth. This is the spirit or the person? Both. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I don't tell them they have to break up. And I don't <laughs> tell them they have to leave. I don't tell them any of those things. I just say to them, that you, this is the truth of what's happening here. You are harming this person. Just see, with, there was one spirit that I encouraged to just spe step out of the body for a while, little while and look at the damage they've just done. And this man stepped out, this spirit stepped out of the body and looked at the lady body that he was connected to and all of the diabetes that was, you know, the damage in the pancreas region that he'd done, he saw. And he'd done it to her father and her grandfather. So and he'd, actually, he'd actually killed successively three generations of their family by his attachment mm. through diabetes. It was because of an emotion that was the yes. same as their emotions. And we talked to him about that and when he understood that he stayed out of her body. Now that didn't guarantee somebody else wouldn't come in because she yeah. needs to do with her emotions. Yes. But he voluntarily stayed out of her body. You don't need to kick them out. Like. <laughs> All you need to do is reason with them and talk to them. Like, how many of you want to stay in a place that you find confining? You won't, will you? You'd only have some good reasons if you did. Some well, big fears what, what or whatever. What that spirit enjoyed doing that to that person? I wouldn't say he enjoyed it. He didn't know what else to do. Okay. He had no idea of what else to do. And so he just did it. And he didn't know the damage he was doing. He just thought he was going from body to body and they were dying on him. <laughs> no, that's what he thought. He didn't know. It wasn't until he was explained to him and, and we got a spirit to come to him to help explain as well what was going on. It wasn't until all of that occurred that he actually realised what was going on. So many spirits to one body at the same time. I've seen some with 30. <laughs> Through a law of attraction. Some manic depressed persons with 30. But how do they manage to they attract them? Yeah. Highly mediumistic people, uh, in particular, these people were. You know, they, they'd be brilliant mediums, mm -hmm. uh, but they were having really big childhood feelings of powerlessness that they were refusing to accept, so they'd become addicted to power, and their spirits were keeping them really powerful. And they were, like, they were, they were sleeping one hour a day mm -hmm. and doing all sorts through the other 23 hours a day. Yeah. And the spirits were keeping them, light, keeping them in that state for as long as possible. And what happens is it exhausts the body eventually. And then when it exhausts the body, the connection drops out completely. And they just go wham over. So what happens when they put these people on medication? And it disconnects the spirits a bit, but not, not wholly. So a lot of people who are schizophrenic, it disconnects the contact with the spirits a bit. But it doesn't actually stop some of the voices appearing in their head and whenever there are moments of clarity those voices reappear uh, and that's why a lot of times one of the voices that reappears for a schizophrenic is they are poisoning you and the reason why this why the spirit says that is he's being pushed away for a bit and he doesn't like that he wants the connection back so the patient stops the medication so the patient stops the medication and he gets the connection back but a lot of our drugs, you know, for depression and asthma and things like that, are actually they're depressing. That's the depressing emotion. Very much. And making it worse and worse. Making it worse, yeah. Mm. Very true. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's about it. Can I think? quickly yeah. ask one? Yeah. <laughs> what about vegetarian? Are we breaking the law when you eat meat? Um, I talked about that yesterday. Oh, did you know? Yeah. Yeah. What was it, Friday night? Friday night. I've denied it, I'm sure you didn't. Oh. <laughs> Friday night it was, and you were there. Yeah. 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 And I said, yeah, I'm not going to eat meat. And I was like, well, I'm not going to eat meat. Last one. Last question. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, the truth is that, yes, um, obviously you break some laws of love if you eat meat. There, there are quite a lot of different laws you break when you do so. Now, the key is, again, to not concentrate on, oh, all right then, because I'm breaking laws of love, I've got to not eat meat. Don't do that. What I'm suggesting you need to do is allow yourself to feel about the process of eating meat. Allow yourself to feel about it for a moment. First thing to feel, how many of you will actually kill the meat to eat it? 
or do you want somebody else to do it for you? Well, I see that's where I stand. Okay. Because I love a bit of bunny and I have to see my husband out when I touch it. Okay. I hold the spotlight, so I, I do recognise it. So you, you're actually in a worse position than your husband at the moment. <laughs> he doesn't like killing anything either. No, so but he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't do it, do it no. Oh, well, but you want to send him out to do it. So you're expecting someone else. Manipulating. Yeah, exactly. And he's doing it out of what he thinks is love, but it's not very good <laughs> love on it. But the thing to remember is this. If I won't do it myself, why won't I do it myself? Because obviously I have some emotional reasons why I won't do it myself, for a start. And I'm not respecting those emotional reasons if I'm getting someone else to do it for me. What do I... Do you feel... Can you feel the emotion of the animal as it's dying? Now, I don't know if any of you have put yourself in a position where you've killed somebody and then, or killed something and then allowed yourself to feel about it. Just imagine for a moment it's your pet dog or your pet cat and you've just slit its throat, how would you feel now? Yeah. Can you see that it, it just matters about the detunement from our emotions yes, yeah. that causes us to want to kill one animal and not another? All right. Allow yourself to feel about all those things. That's all I'm suggesting to you. Allow yourself to feel it, then make a decision based on your feelings. Is, is there a room for negotiation? <laughs> how about unfurred live dicks and cow's milk? We're not killing anything. True. And with those kind of things, with dairy products and, and, and you know chicken products and so forth, ask yourself one question. Am I exploiting this animal or am I loving this animal? Well, if you look at... Uh, look, factory hens, yeah, you're exploiting it. No, I, I, would, I would have no doubt yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. A, a, uh, a hen that was um, bred... Um, or allowed to, allowed to be fertilised. Why are you breeding it? Well, it was. Pardon? Why are you breeding them? Well, the, that's okay. Um, so that it has the chickens. Eggs. So, so that they will have play. Yeah. yeah. Eggs. Like, is that that right? eggs. On the other on the other hand, that that chook that lays the eggs would not have life if it weren't for the fact that I wanted to have eggs. There, there, there would be. Uh, I don't know what it would be or where it would be, because it doesn't have a soul, but it wouldn't have had a, a life experience. Very true. So, you know, is, is that a valid, positive thing? Yeah. What, what will you do when this, when this hen stops laying? Oh, Are you going well, to keep yeah. feeding it? Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. In, my, in, in this particular <laughs> case, we don't have, I don't, I doubt we'd be allowed to have chooks where we are in a sort of suburban block, yeah. but, and I'd hope that that would happen. Um, but, uh, but can you see that if, if, I, if I feel upset as soon as the chook, the chook stops laying eggs, that I'm feeding it still and it's not giving me eggs, mm. then I've got an emotional issue and I'm not in love now. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. So I've exploited them. If I, if I feel that feeling, I've exploited them. And I need to consider why I'm choosing to exploit them. Right? But if it's your pet chook and you're going to look after it after it does, it's like Exactly, exactly. Like, again, what would love do? Yeah. What does love do? Ask yourself. We've well, actually yeah. got um, egg sandwiches for lunch. Have you? Egg sandwiches for lunch. What would love do? Do you love these chooks that give you these eggs? Or what do you... Have not met them. Do you keep them around? So what about when you're really old and not having a quality of life and you... So let's say it's been run over and the hind legs are that badly damaged and, you know, it can't well, get around. I'm, or... I'm thinking about animals that we've had, say we had a cat that was 20 and obviously... And couldn't eat any more properly yeah. and all those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, all of those yeah. things that old age and so you take them to the vet and stay with them while they put them to sleep. Well, they it, them are animals. you doing an act of love or not? Ask yourself that. That's all you need well, to ask yourself. What's yes, your intention? The only reason for doing it is out of love, so they don't have to So then why are you asking me the question? <laughs> <laughs> because it's still very traumatic for a long time afterwards. Well, if it's traumatic, it's because of deeper emotions within you that you know, a child will place that you need yeah. to release. So what about euthanasia? Euthanasia, that was the question I asked earlier, about assisted suicide, euthanasia is similar oh, thing, isn't it? Um, the, the same time, kind of thing, often what we're doing is trying to keep someone alive when in reality we just need to let them do what they decide to do. So, so, so the truth is, like, if a, the person makes the choice 
and they need to make the choice and make the decision and then carry out the action. I, I can't help them carry out the action because I know that their problem is caused by lots of emotions that are all healable and that, and that I'll be in a state, I feel, shortly I'll be in a state and all of you, I feel, shortly can also be in a similar state where you could heal any of the Aramon that they have. So when we're in that state, would we even, would these questions even rise? Even. Most of them wouldn't, would they? Like if you could heal your animal of its problem, then would you bother, would you want to kill it? No. Obviously you would yeah. just let it pass. But I'm thinking about old rage, you know. Yeah, I'm thinking about that too. Why does anything get old? Because you depend on everyone else. And... No, it's why it gets old is because of emotions within that have been denied all of its mm -hmm. life. And I'm talking about your animals. Your pets mm -hmm. are a reflection of your emotions. Mm -hmm. And we can, that's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. and I can <laughs> illustrate that in many illustrations too. But your pets are a deny... Are, are a reflection of the denial of your own emotion. Right? If they're hanging on, right, it's because of you they're hanging on. There's something going, there's emotions inside of you you do not want to let yourself feel. That's why they're hanging on. If, if, if an older person's hanging yeah, on. An older person, say, with Alzheimer's or something like that. You know, um, why have they got Alzheimer's? Yeah, why? Because they don't want to remember things. Mm -hmm. Why don't they want to remember things? Because it's too painful to remember. So we could prevent all Alzheimer's just by all of us choosing to feel our emotion. Mm. So that's memory as well for any of us. Totally. Don't totally. with our emotions. The only reason why memory disappears in our life is because we don't want to remember emotionally the events. There's an emotional signature that we don't want to remember. That's why our memory starts disappearing on us. Right? And that's why it disappears on some and not others. Because some want to not remember more than others. Right? And all of these things are all resolvable and we wouldn't be asking these questions once they're resolved, would, they? would we? We'd be living a perfect life and instead of looking about 50 when we look about 50 and we are 50, we'll look about 25 when we are 50. Right? Isn't the fact things are just going to continue on as they are? No. No, it's not a fact. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, so when, I, is all, when is all Alzheimer's going to disappear then? When, when each successive generation owns more and more of its own emotions. And when will that be? Uh, this is the generation. You are the start of the generation that is going to have its own emotions. Don't you feel like that? Yes. Very well. Yeah. There's an emotion in you now, though, of, of feeling of sort of helplessness that you need to let yourself feel. You sort of feel that if I, I own my own emotion, that's not going to change the world. But I, I'm saying that it will change the world even just one person owning their own emotion mm -hmm. changes the world. Yeah. So, you know, let yourself feel the helplessness. Let yourself go there. So with our children, which is different to us, where they're not, <laughs> don't have that Victorian era thing going on, we should let them be. I emotion. said the last question was <laughs> <laughs> And I know you can keep going. Uh, well, um, I, I want to stop that, but so I'm going to stop yeah, this. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and we'll have a break, and, and, and we're not going to start again, because I've got my son, one of my sons coming, who lives in Tasmania, wow. that I haven't seen for a little while. Um, but, but I want to say that with all these questions, they all have answers, and you will be able to answer your own questions when you develop in the manner that we've talked about on the DVDs, and you'll feel the answers yourself. You will actually go through all of these answers yourself and all of them will be answered for you. So my suggestion is do that divine love work, do your soul work, do your emotional work, focus on that and all of these other things will be added to you. Thanks for your time.